Greetings, everybody. Welcome to the Renaissance Woodworker Live. Um, yeah, we're here. It's uh, time for another open mic night, <laughs> open Q&A night. Um, good news. I've already got a couple questions in the chat room. Just a reminder to those in the chat room. I love it if you can put them in all caps because it makes me able to see them through all the other stuff and pick them out from across the room. So um, no real agenda tonight. Really just want to take your questions. I've got about 45, 50 minutes or so to, to do that. Um, so I say, you know what, let's get into it. And it's actually really uh, appropriate because there's a question about using a strop in the, uh, in the chat room already. So I was about to do some stropping anyway. Um, I've got a couple of different strops here. And the question is really, can a barber strop work as, as a stropping tool? And let me see, let's grab a narrow chisel and my one inch chisel. And the question is, or the answer to can you use a barber strop? The answer is yes, with a butt. And I'm hoping I can find, I've got a length of leather that I want to use and I have no idea where it is. That's not good. Well, crap. Um, barber strop is, is, you know, just a flexible strip. Um, this is horse butt strop and it would have, uh, a little more light on this. Here we go. Um, the barber strap would have literally hung off the barber's belt, attached to his belt. He pulls it up and just strops back and forth, stropping the razor back and forth while it's hanging from the belt. So it would be a loose strip of leather like this, but it's quite a bit more flexible than this stiff horse butt. Um, and I've got uh, the same leather that I've used, thin suede that I've used to line the jaws on my leg vise, on my ram tang. Um, all of that is what I was looking for. I was looking for the strip of it. That would be the same principle. And while at face value it could be really good because that leather is going to be flexible enough to conform to whatever tool you're taking it to, the real issue is as you get into really wide chisels, this one inch chisel might be getting a bit too wide, but the pliable leather is going to want to bend around. As I push this in, it's going to kind of bend around it and you could possibly more prematurely round off the corners. But strops in general, the more you use them, the more the chance you are that you're going to create a slightly rounded edge. But my big issue would be with a wider tool, you're going to have a hard time actually getting even pressure on the entire tool because there's no stiffness to the leather itself, I'll be pushing here and I'm gonna get probably good pressure on the outer corners, but very little pressure in the center because it's just too pliable to support it. On the converse, if you go with a narrower chisel, I can get a little bit more pressure, especially if I put my fingers down close to the edge here, but it, the, the leather is still flexing pretty substantially underneath me and it's gonna be unpredictable the results that you're gonna get. So it doesn't necessarily mean you couldn't use a barber strop because it's more pliable, but what I would do is drop it onto a surface where you've got full support throughout. Then you're certain that you're getting even pressure along the entire edge of the chisel. So I suppose if you were able to come across a vintage barber strop and you were to actually just put it down on a surface or do something like adhere it to a hardwood board, the same thing would work. The nice, thin, very low nap of that barber strop could be very beneficial, but I don't think I would want to use it like a traditional barber strop hanging off your belt. It's just going to be too flexible. It's going to produce inconsistent, if not unpredictable results on your, uh, your edges. So there we go. That would be my thought on that. And I, you know, it's funny that you bring that up because I just saw a, um, a vintage barber strop in uh, an antique store very recently. And I thought, hmm, I wonder if I should pick that up. But it had all kinds of ornate stuff on it. And it was, guy was asking several hundred dollars for it. It had collectible like engravings and like this stainless steel, um, it wasn't stainless steel, it was silver, uh, 
like clasp on the top of it. It was very cool looking, but definitely not something I was going to use to repurpose for um, my own shop. <laughs> so that didn't really make sense. Uh, Richard wants to know, oh, and that question was from Paul, by the way. Thanks for that. Good question, Paul. Uh, Richard wants to know if the, the weighted mallet was actually in the opening credit, this guy right here. Um, no, this was not made by me. This is made by Shenandoah Toolworks. They're located in uh, Northern Virginia. They're near the Shenandoah National Park. Fantastic mallet, by the way. They're good stuff. So what else we got here? Uh, Andrew says, I'm planning to use shellac flakes on white oak arts and crafts piece. Any tips? Um, well, I guess it depends upon what the final look, what, what you want that final look to look like. Um, for me, shellac, the reason I like shellac is because, uh, first of all, uh, subsequent coats essentially burn into one another. So you don't have the layering of coats you can get with like a polyurethane or a varnish. You essentially get one big coat, which makes things really forgiving if you, um, if you have scratches or issues in the coat itself. You know, if maybe you get a whole bunch of dust nibs in there and you need to do an excessive amount of sanding between coats, it's not a big deal. The other shellac is just going to blend perfectly into that, that coat that you already put on there. So it makes it real easy. Uh, you don't have to worry so much about stuff settling in it because it's relatively easy to clean that up and put a new coat on. But what I like about shellac is, is it dries super, super fast if you cut it really thin. So I rarely, if I'm making, if I'm working with shellac flakes um, and I'm making my own pound cut, I'm generally going to go a one pound cut, sometimes even lighter than that, like a half pound cut. That's a bit much, but a one pound cut just, it's so dilute. The, the, um, the alcohol flashes off like that. So it dries super fast in between coats and it's dilute enough that it flows out over the surface really, really fast and really evenly. So it's kind of an idiot proof type of finish. You can go up as high as a, as a two pound cut. Um, I believe if you buy the can stuff, I think that's generally around a three pound cut. The um, Zinser Seal Coat, I think it's the name of the product. I think that's a two pound cut, but don't quote me on that. It's definitely more dilute, but it's just so nice because it runs out so easily. Um, as far as the tips, you know, as far as mixing it, uh, relatively straightforward, grind the stuff up as thin as possible. So it, um, dissolves relatively quickly, but give it plenty of time, you know, put it in a jar and, and let it dissolve for 24 hours or so before you do it. Um, I apply, uh, with a brush and that with the low viscosity of a one pound cut, the brush is fine. Any brush marks you get level themselves evenly. You could also use um, a rag, but if I'm going to use a rag, it's generally more of a French polish type approach. And in that particular instance, it's just keep that thing moving. And then overall with shellac, especially with more dilute cuts, don't go back over it. Like set up a system, say you're doing a, a, a tabletop uh, or the case side, set up a system and know I'm going to proceed from left to right and full length, top to bottom. But I mean, you at least when the first coat goes on, you can tell what you finished and what you have it. But what you don't want to do is go back over that coat. More than likely, if it's like a normal case side, you know, of, of a piece of furniture, by the time you get down to the bottom, to the finished part of that, the top part has already started to tack up. And if you go back over it with a brush, you're just going to cause more problems. The ability of it to flow out easily while it's wet is going to be negated when it's already started to tack up on you. So don't, um, we all do it. You know, you see a part start to get dry and you go back over it and try to keep it wet. This is not uh, uh, an oil or something like that where you want it to soak in a whole bunch. Shellac is a film finish. So it's going to, the more dilute ones will soak in a little bit, but it's meant to sit on top of the surface to form a film on top of the surface. So just finish the coat and walk away, rely upon it to self level deal with any dry spots because maybe the wood has more ingrain or curl figure or something that's soaked up more material deal with that on your next subsequent coat and then i go back in between coats with 600 grit sandpaper i just have sanding sponges as thin sanding sponges using a sanding block where'd my sanding block go oh it's in the cabinet with my sanding stuff i just do it uh, a light 600 grit sanding in between and then brush it on again and it's it's super easy finish to apply um, where it gets difficult is in the heavier cuts and a lot of the commercially mixed stuff that has wax and things like that that builds up really, really fast and it can look kind of plasticky really fast. So uh, when in doubt, stay nice and dilute and you'll be just fine. It's a convoluted question to relatively sensible, uh, uh, 
Simple answer. What is the best way to pack tools so they don't get damaged in moving? Ooh. Um, <laughs> chisel, uh, you want some sort of protector on the edges. So when you're talking about chisels, I take a bit of cardboard like I've got right here. This is just cardboard that's been folded over on itself and I've just duct taped around it. And what this allows is me to slip a chisel in like that and it perfectly will protect that edge. Um, if you are just traveling, you know, one place to the next, you'll be unpacking once you get there. I don't think you have to worry too much about like rust prevention or anything like that. If your stuff is going to be in transit or going into storage for a long period of time, you're probably going to want to wipe everything down with an oil. If it's going to be a really long time, you might have to get even more aggressive um, on, um, you know, large iron surfaces like a power tool or a plane. I don't think you need to go all the way to like a cosmoline type application, but you probably want to put some sort of um, rust emitter in the box with the stuff. Silica packets, Z-rust emitters, or even just a block of camphor wax thrown in there to have active rust prevention. A good coat of wax on all your tools to prevent rust is a good idea, but you definitely want to physically cover your edges. Don't just necessarily wrap it in bubble tape or something like that and expect that the bubble tape is going to prevent the edges from banging into one another. A cardboard cover like this and then wrapping it, or even better, sticking the whole thing in a nice tool roll, especially if you can get a nice waxed canvas tool roll. There's several guys making this. This is from Texas Heritage Woodworks. There's a couple makers of these now. The wax canvas actually has some rust prevention built into it as well. That's why I keep my carving gouges in there because they just, they never rust in there. Planes, again, take the blade out, take the moving parts out that could get banged into and dented, wrap them individually, and then wrap up the whole plane in some sort of bubble wrap. Again, taking into account some rust prevention there just because you're not exactly sure what's going to happen, even on that kind of short trip. Um, but, you know, other than that, just be aware that things are going to jostle around and bang around. And if you are securing stuff in such a way that the edges can't bang into one another, you should be just fine. Uh, related to shellac, uh, must 190 proof be used or can you use one used denatured alcohol? Um, yeah, you can use denatured alcohol. Um, I have never had the pleasure of using 190 proof stuff. Um, I understand it does make a difference. Um, one of the one of my apprentices in the hand tool school um, ironically lives in California, so he literally has to smuggle the stuff in because it's illegal out there but he's um, been using the pure grain stuff and apparently it just makes for a clear, better um, mix of shellac. I've always used denatured alcohol bought at Home Depot and I've never really had any issues there, but I also have nothing to compare that against. Um, I remember attending a conversation, uh, a talk at a SAPFA meeting with Don Williams. Uh, Don Williams, uh, he's retired from the Smithsonian now, but for years and years and years, he was a furniture curator and restorer specializing in, in you know, 18th century finishes. He's the man when it comes to this stuff. Um, he definitely says the higher quality of the alcohol, the better, the clearer, the, the, the higher quality of the shellac you're gonna get. Um, I guess I just, I don't wanna say I don't care enough. <laughs> Maybe my pieces aren't good enough to necessarily go that far. One day I'm gonna give it a shot, but you know, to be honest, since we're talking about shellac, I'm gonna go on a little tangent here. Um, I just got a new can of this stuff. Um, if you go to shellacfinishes.com, uh, places run by VJ Velji, he's kind of the shellac man. Um, he's got a great source of shellac flakes, by the way. He's got a, a cool DVD on um, French polishing, which is really beneficial. It's just a good source to go to to get French polishing supplies. But he also has a product now called Royal Lac, and it is a shellac synthetic blend. Um, there's some other polymers and stuff in here. And this stuff is really cool to the point where I'm wondering if I'm ever going to mix my own shellac again. Um, obviously it comes in a can. It is already mixed. It's already liquid. But it has um, a lot of the stuff that people are concerned about, about shellac maybe not being an exterior finish, which VJ tends to debunk that myth. But he really debunks it with this synthetic I don't necessarily call it, it's a synthetic blend. So it is actual shellac 
the stuff coming off the bugs, the excretions from the bugs is in here, but then there's a, a fun exotic mix of other polymers and acrylics, I think, in here. You never know when you read the can of these things what's actually in them. But uh, super, super easy to prepare, very dilute. Um, works just like that one pound cut I'm talking about, dries super, super fast, and it's actually more durable, at least according to the press material, it's more durable. I just really like the look of it. This is a super blonde um, dewaxed Royal Lac is what it's called. You can get it in a variety of finishes. It's just something to look into. Um, I've been buying it in these small one pint cans just because um, I'm not exactly sure what the shelf life is. Normally shelf life of already mixed shellac is something to be concerned about. And I should know, I don't know, which is why I'm not doing a review on this product right now. Um, I imagine the shelf life is, is longer than the other stuff. This says it's comparable to a two pound cut shellac. Still, really, really cool product. Worth checking out if you do a lot of shellac work. So, YouTube rejects all caps questions. I'm getting plenty of them. That would be stupid if YouTube did that, but it's YouTube. Uh, Tim says, I want to build uh, a table to go over the back of my, a C table to go over the back of my couch. What type of joiner should I use? Um, well, it could be a couple of things. Anytime you're making, you're rounding a corner, you've got to turn the corner on a joint. Oh, that's dusty. Um, the dovetail is probably the, the best joint for maintaining that strength around a corner. Um, but there's nothing that says you couldn't use a miter. I mean, if you've got, if you're talking about a table itself, you've got a wider surface, probably gonna use a little bit thicker board. You can get a substantial amount of glue surface in the miter face alone. Plus you can strengthen that with splines or loose tenons, um, run splines in this way, run a spline a long way and make a really, really strong joint. Um, even using uh, a strong adhesive like epoxy can add quite a bit to this whole thing to make it relatively strong. And the only reason you would do that over dovetails is maybe you don't want the look of the dovetail. If it were me, I would use a, where is it? Come on, looking for a joint here. Well, here it is. I would use a full blind dovetail. I'm not gonna, make any claims about strength over uh, you know, a spline miter or a loose tenon miter or through dovetails or uh, a full blind miter dovetail. The reason I like the full blind miter dovetail is A, I don't think it's really any harder to cut than a miter. Um, miter's got a whole lot of reference surface. It's got to perfectly line up. The only reference surface that has to line up here is this little bit of, a, of the edge, this little bit of miter. Um, the rest of it is just normal dovetails. And because they're entirely hidden, they don't even have to be all that pretty because you just can't see them when they're put together. But the real reason that this is so nice is because the assembly, the glue up rather, because it registers together like this, once it's together, the miter is not slipping back and forth and you can clamp it up like you would clamp a normal case. So then you're getting that corner joint with fully, um, hidden joinery like you would give with the miter. But if you want exposed joinery, then by all means, go with a dovetail. That makes really good sense. Um, I would avoid a tenon just because the tenon is gonna, the mortise rather is gonna be so close to the end of the board, you're gonna have short grain there. It can be uh, a bit of an issue. So you want a corner spanning joint. That's why dovetail miter or a dovetail miter or a full blind dovetail, good way to go. Uh, buh, 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 buh. Mike wants to try dovetail soon. He needs a saw. Headed to Lee Valley this weekend and a dozuki is left the, uh, less than half the Veritas. You know what? I'm going to anger some people here. And I'm going to say, yes, I think a dozuki is a good move. If you're, if you're just getting into it and you're not sure about it, you're right. The dozuki is much, much cheaper than... Um, it's not much, much cheaper. The Veritas saw is relatively cheap. But to be honest, I am not a fan of the Veritas dovetail saw. I don't like the tooth geometry. I don't like the hang of the, the handle. I don't like the shape of the handle. And I think if you get into hand tools a lot and you find yourself doing a lot of hand tools and you want to look at a Western saw, um, you're going to end up upgrading to something else later. I think you'll find that the, the Veritas dovetail saw will be kind of a band-aid solution. If you're just starting out, the Dozuki is really, really good. Um, 
If you want to use a guide, David Barron makes a good set of guides. I did a review on them. I don't, I don't use guides, but I know a lot of people who've had good success with them and it works better with a Dozuki. So I just think as an entry level thing, I mean, you can buy Dozukis for like $15 now. Um, it just seems to be, you know, kind of nothing lost because you're always going to find a need for that Dozuki around the shop. If you want to get into Western saws, I suppose the Veritas is a cheap way to do that, but I think there's a reason why it's so cheap. Normally, you look around my shop, I got a lot of Veritas tools. I love Veritas. I just don't like the performance of that saw. It's just not, doesn't stand up to some of the other stuff on the market. Uh, Peter wants to know what my thoughts are on using salt to increase the open time in hide glue. Um, I have, I, let me, let me, how do I phrase this right? I've used it, but I've never mixed it. Um, I did this in a, um, uh, a, a chair building class I did at the Woodwright School, uh, Roy Underhill School. And I didn't actually mix up that high glue, but I know salt was added to it to increase the open time. Yeah, it was a longer open time. I don't do it in my own shop because I've never run into a situation where I needed that much open time. If I'm doing a really, really complex glue up that needs a whole lot of open time, I generally just don't use hide glue. Um, and I use hide glue for just about everything. So it would have to be a really long open time for me, or I'm breaking down the glue up into smaller parts so that I just don't have to worry about that. For the most part, I use hide glue because I want it to tack up a little bit faster. It works using salt, but as far as how much salt to add, I'm not the guy to ask because I, like I said, I've never actually mixed it up myself. Um, check out Patrick Edwards, the guy who makes Old Barn Glue. I believe he has some stuff on his blog about that. Um, but yeah, it's just not, um, it's not something I've done. A, I, I have done to be able to say yes or no. Um, personally, I don't know that it's really, really necessary. Use another glue in that particular case. What material would you look for in a shop apron? I've used canvas. I've used just some sort of cotton blend. And now I've got this um, heavier waxed canvas thing. Um, I don't like leather. I find that it's too heavy. It ends up being too hot. I do like canvas because it's strong enough that, you know, I can, well, I'm not going to stab myself, but it resists scratches and things like that. It's also firm enough that you can, if you get a little bit of glue on it, you can kind of scrape it off and it's um, dry glue that is, and it's not going to ruin the material. Uh, whereas like a cotton blend can actually tear it up. But, you know, ultimately you're, you're probably just going to have to try a couple and see, you know, what the, the, the lighter cotton ones, I just don't think they provide enough protection and they're not durable enough over time. So I think canvas is probably the way to go, but I know a lot of people who love leather. To me, it's just, I guess I'm just, I don't look good in leather. That's what it comes down to. I'm not cool enough to pull off leather, I suppose. <laughs> oh, goody. Mark has a lumber industry question. <laughs> it might be international. Have you any idea why plywood is so much cheaper than MDF in the USA? but the other way around in Europe. Uh, because most of the, um, um, most, well, there's, <laughs> this is not an easy answer actually. Um, plywood, well, here's the easy way. MDF for the most part is not made in the US. MDF is generally made abroad. Um, the MDF that is made in the US has to I'm going to get people in trouble. It has to adhere to a higher standard. Um, it has to adhere not only in the production to ISO 9000 standards, but it has to adhere to NAUF and CARB compliance standards. CARB is California Air Resources Board. Um, environmental standards. The international ones, um, technically they have to adhere to them in order to be imported, but it's a, it's a different game. And a lot of the stuff is being manufactured in China because it can be done so much cheaper, but there's a lot of corners that can be cut. At the same time, MDF is not a super high quality product and there's, not, um, there's nothing like voids or veneers, anything you have to worry about. We're just talking about you know, regurgitated termite bar for whatever it is, packed in together and pressed under heat with adhesive. Um, you can cut a lot of corners in that. So for the most part, it is made elsewhere. Plywood, on the other hand, um, isn't normally cheaper. It is cheaper because of recent tariffs that have jacked up the price of international plywood substantially four times in the last three years. Five times, actually, if you include the second round of the countervailing tariff. So plywood has been continually driven up abroad. 
we're, we're seeing domestic plywood start to climb. I call it the gas station effect. If guy at the gas station on one side of the street is selling gas for, you know, $2 a gallon. It's not, I wish it was $2 a gallon. And the guy across the street, you know, you see those two gas stations on either side of the street, he sells it for 201. This guy raises his price to 201 or 202009, you know, um, and just because, hey, the market says you can hold $2.01, I'm going to go $2.01 minus a tenth of a cent, you know, that 201.9 or 200.9, that type of thing. Um, so since the Chinese plywood has been jacked up, in some instances, some mills, almost 75%, actually, there's a couple mills at 150% increase, that cheap Chinese plywood is now more expensive and the domestic market wants to be viewed as a higher quality panel. Well, you get what you pay for, right? If my higher quality panel is cheaper than the Chinese stuff, does that mean that this is now a lower quality panel? So perception's reality. They raise the price to say, we're still higher quality. So therefore we're kind of maintaining that gap between the Chinese and uh, the, the North American made stuff. So while you may see a cheaper battle right now, that's gonna change pretty dramatically. You're gonna start to see that North American stuff go up. Um, and that's constantly changing because there's constantly tariffs and all kinds of fun stuff being levied at this point. So, uh, yeah, sorry. <laughs> Plywood is, uh, is a very, very dynamic market. The prices are always all over the place. Oh, um, oops, I just missed the, the question there. My chat room just jumped up on me. Uh, Bench Doxy, Bench Doxy Woodshop says he's had success using canning salt on liquid high glue and works well. Um, what, uh, what is your mixture? Oh, okay. Uh, Josh Klein, Mortis Intended Magazine. You're right. I knew I saw that. Uh, Josh Klein has a good recipe of it. If you don't have Mortis Intended Magazine, you probably should get it because A, it's awesome. B, it's awesome and you want to support Josh Klein. If you just don't want to buy it, I guarantee you if you were to email Josh Klein, he would give you the recipe for free because that's the kind of guy Josh is. So go for it. Um, I saw a question in here that wasn't in all caps. So yeah, um, Kyle wants to know, can you recommend smell-free rust prevention? <sighs> um, using chameleon oil and I would love Bow Shield uh, type product. Um, I actually don't like using Bow Shield. Um, I use Bow Shield as like the nuclear option. Like if something's not going to get used for a while, I use there. But yeah, it's it's pretty volatile. It can stink up the place. Um, uh, bu -bu -bum. Renaissance wax, I like for most of the waxing of my tools. It has a slight smell, but it's it's a low. Um, I don't know if it's technically a low VOC product, but it, it um, it's volatile enough that the smell goes away very quickly. I'll wax the only cast iron tool I have in my shop with Renaissance wax and like 30 seconds later, the smell is gone. Um, that's a really, really good product. It is expensive, but I've had the same little can of Renaissance wax for more than 10 years and I'm still, um, still using it. Um, Camellia oil is a really good way to go if you're using it, your tools a lot and you're wiping them down constantly. Uh, Camellia oil would be fine. Jojoba oil would be fine as well. Um, there are some paste wax manufacturers that are meant to be like fully green products. It's not Brie wax, I can tell you that because there's toluene in Brie wax. Um, oh man, I'm forgetting the name of it. Actually, uh, General Finishes has a wax product that's, it was originally marketed as a cutting board wax product. So you can look at General Finishes. I would recommend you go to like Penn State Industries, PennStateIND.com or craft supplies, uh, woodturnerscatalog.com. They have several wax products um, that are specifically meant to be green in nature. Um, and any of those will work well as a rust preventative. Uh, the, for the most part, your rust emitters are not going to be smell free because that's how they do their job. Um, smells are particular in nature. That's how we can smell stuff. There's little tiny particles. Don't think about that next time you smell something bad. Um, so the rust emitter is emitting small particles that settle on top of the ferrous surfaces and before that uh, provide that barrier. So the fact that they rely upon particulate nature means they're going to have some smell. Some of them are better than others. Um, I have a, a Z rust emitter that I keep in my toolbox that I don't know whether I've just gotten used to the smell um, or I'm well ventilated enough that I don't really worry about it. But um, look into the eco-friendly green paste wax options. There's a lot of them out there. Um, probably Google can uh, 
point you to an actual product, but I know I've seen some in the turning supply catalogs that are meant to be used as finish. Um, probably any butcher block wax would do the same thing too, since it's meant to be um, food safe as well. Uh, hey everybody, thanks for showing up by the way. This is very, uh, lots of people here, lots of questions. Hey David, um, do the Veritas carcass and tenon saws have the same concerns as the dovetail saw? No, they do not. Great question. Um, while they're good saws, while, I mean, certainly they don't, they're not going to hold a candle to something like Bad Axe, but I mean, come on, there's a huge price difference. But I think the Veritas tenon and carcass saws um, can, can definitely uh, hold their own against like a Lee Nielsen saw. The um, hang angle on the Veritas, I don't know, I don't have one. I don't know what I'm looking for. The hang angle on the Veritas tenon saw is pretty good. It's a high hang angle, so it presents the saw really nicely. Um, it's got a good weight, good balance to it. I do like the extra long handle for that. Um, the carcass saw is, is fine. The hang angle may be a little bit high, but for the most part, it works pretty well for dado type cuts or through cuts. Um, I, and I've used, I've used both of those pretty extensively at shows. I used them when I was teaching down in Texas. Uh, good, good, um, good tools. The, the problem with the Veritas tenon saw is it just doesn't feel right for the preciseness of the cut. I also think it's a bit, um, a bit finely pitched and the rake angle is not right. It's, it's difficult to start, which is a combination of handle and hang angle. The other ones, I've never had the issues with starting there. Granted, you could buy a Veritas dovetail saw and relax the rake on maybe the first 15 to 20 teeth and you would make it a lot easier to start. Um, one thing I've not used the Veritas dovetail saw at is my, at my joinery bench, working up higher. That might change the, the equation a fair amount because the saw itself, or excuse me, because the work itself is gonna be higher, you're gonna approach it from a different angle. Using where I have used the Veritas saw is down on a planing bench like this where I'm working with my arm a little bit lower down and I end up having to take a really, really wide stance and, and it, it's, it's awkward in my, um, my opinion. At the same time, we could be dealing with a height issue. I'm six foot four. So somebody who's five five might have a different issue. Um, so I can't remember who asked that question, but he did say, he was going to Lee Valley. So tell you what, you're going to Lee Valley. They've got stuff set up there. They have a Moxon vice in most of those places set up. Make some test cuts, try it out for yourself and make a determination from there because there's a lot of variables in play. For me personally, it has never performed well, um, but I've had good experience with the tenons um, and the, the carcass saws. Tim Cook. Nice to hear from you, Tim. We appreciate all your work at Apple. You do good work. Um, I have a jack plane, smoother, and router plane. What should I think about getting next? Gotta love that question. Jack plane, smoother, and a router. I'd get a saw next, Tim. Sounds like you're pretty good on planes. Jack plane can do all of your rough work. You can do your, your jointing work. Um, you've got the smoother already, so you can do your pre-finishing work there. Your router plane is going to do all of your joiner work. So if you're not limiting it to just planes, I would see where you are in saws and get yourself a saw. Saws are going to do so much more work than planes. If the question is, it must be a plane, like I've got saws, I want it to be a plane, I would get yourself a rabbit plane. Um, mm, rabbit plane or a plow plane? Personally, I'm prone, I'm partial to rabbit planes. And why rabbit plane? I mean good old fashioned wooden blocks, skewed rabbit plane, not, um, not a moving filister or even the the Veritas uh, moving filister. These guys are incredibly useful, very powerful. We're cutting rabbits, obviously, cross grain filisters. Um, they're just, they're, because they're so simple, they're much more utilitarian. Same reason the router plane is so utilitarian because there's just, there's not a lot to the thing. Um, it would be a close tie with a plow plane, I think, just because any project you're doing with drawers is gonna have grooves in it. Um, frame and panel, same thing. Um, you know, you're gonna find a lot of use for a plow plane. So your next immediate question would be, do I get a plow plane or do I get the new Veritas combination plane? I don't know. <laughs> There's a huge price tag difference. So my gut says the, the Veritas combination plane would be fun to have and it would do a lot of things, but man, that's, that's a bit expensive. So, yeah. Um, Tim, ultimately you need to ask yourself, what I try to do is look at what the next project I'm gonna build 
and what tool would make that project easier, what tool would make that project more fun, um, and I would look at that as my next tool. Um, and if you're, if you're rewarding yourself with a new tool every time you build a piece of furniture, hey, there's, there's worse things you can do there. But honestly, uh, I see way too much focus on planes and not enough focus on saws. Saws, saws are awesome. <laughs> That's why I have so many of them. That's what I'm sticking to. How often do you sharpen your plane irons? Oh, wow. Um, I sharpen all my tools probably more often than most people think because I live and die by a strop. Um, for the most part, with my rougher planes where I'm not requiring such a um, finished surface, uh, I'm a little bit more lax in that. Um, I couldn't say, you know, once a week or something like that, but certainly, um, like the jack planes, probably getting sharpened two to three times in a project, you know, building a typical piece of furniture, it's getting sharpened there. The four plane gets sharpened like before the project and there's, it won't get sharpened again until I start the next project. Um, and, and you know, the four plane that's my thickness planer, if you will, it goes in the cabinet until I start the next project. So I'll sharpen it up right before then. Um, smoothing plane, uh, I rely upon how it's performing. I will certainly, when I pull out the smoothing plane, I'm in pre-finishing mode. I'm getting the surface ready to apply that finish. So I will sharpen it right then and there because maybe I, don't, I, you know, maybe I don't know when it was last used because I'm probably not using that smoothing plane anywhere else in the project. So I'm going to sharpen it up. Most likely when I say sharpen it up, I'm going to hone it up on the strop right before um, I do the finish and I'm doing that finishing coat and I'll rely upon how it's performing. So for instance, the blanket chest that I finished used a lot of curly cherry and was really prone to tear out. So I stopped and sharpened or stropped, I should say, like six or seven times just in surfacing the full cabinet. And that's what the performance was telling me. It was starting to get a little harder to push. I was running into situations where there was a little bit more tearing. I stropped it, the tearing went away. As soon as tearing started to come back even slightly, I stropped it and, and it, it went away. Um, so for the very specific use planes, like the joiner and the scrub and things like that, generally it's like once per project is when they're being sharpened. And it's kind of based upon how I work. You know, I'm doing the milling of that particular part. And once I'm done with that part, the plane goes in the cabinet and is not needed again for that particular project. So there's no reason to sharpen it again. Chisels, on the other hand, there's a reason I have a strop floating around on my bench. There's a strop on my joiner bench. There's a strop on my um, tool cabinet. They're all over the shop. I've got another one over there because I'm stropping constantly. I will strop three and four times just in chopping out the baseline of, of you know, a case side or something, dev tes on a case side. Just because the more you sharpen, the less you sharpen. Sounds a little weird, but that's the way it goes. Alfie Shine Wax, that's, that's a good, Gazank, good point, good point. Um, that is a good product. I've heard really good things about it. Um, and it actually, it's not smell free, but it's got a nice, pleasant smell. Oh, look at that. Joshua's high glue recipe is right here in the chat room. So if you're looking for it, there it is. And thanks to the miracle of YouTube live chat replay, it will be there even after this broadcast is over. That's nice. Are mortise chisels of real additional value over regular bench chisels? Lots of mortises being cut without them. I think so. I mean, and I'll, I'll couch that answer by saying, you know, there's lots of other tools that you could buy before you get to a mortise chisel. Um, bench chisel certainly can cut a mortise just like, you know, uh, like a mortise chisel. But specifically, the English pattern, also known as the pig sticker style mortise chisel, is going to do... Um, a much better job than a bench chisel. First of all, it's stouter, so you're not going to worry about um, breaking the chisel. You can cut, cut, you can grind a much steeper bevel on it, so you're going to get a much more durable edge. Um, not that you want to do a whole lot of levering when you're deep inside a mortise, but um, let me grab a mortise. So you're using the prying motion as you're chopping down, you're, you're pulling, rocking forward and back, and you're using that motion to lever out chips from the bottom. That can be a hell of a lot of stress 
um, and a quarter inch bench chisel, because a lot of our mortises are a quarter inch wide, that can be a lot of stress on the relatively thin cross section of a quarter inch bench chisel um, as compared to the cross section of this pig sticker. So you've got a lot more durability here. More important, the English style has a trapezoidal shape. Um, it's thinner on this end of the chisel, the bevel side of the chisel, than it is on the flat side of the chisel, which allows you to drive in really deep and be able to rock forward and release from the cut because it's narrower on the heel side of the bevel. It actually releases from the cut a lot easier. And um, a lot of people um, I've heard say, well, that's a problem. Like Lee Nielsen makes their mortise chisels perfectly square and cross section. And supposedly that's there to allow you to guide the chisel down straight. The problem I have with that is if that chisel is started at all off square, there's no ability to really steer it as it drives down. It's stuck in there very firmly. Certainly it's a little bit harder to free from a deep mortise, but that's only once you get like an inch or two deep into the mortise. With the slight trapezoidal shape, you actually have some ability to steer minutely as you go down. So if you found that the chisel skewed slightly and it's cutting at a slight angle, you've got that relief area because essentially the chisel is pivoting on the back edge. You can't do that with a bench chisel because it's that back edge is, is wedged in there tightly. Plus the more you twist and everything, that is a lot of stress on the relatively thin steel of a bench chisel. So the reason I wouldn't put it as a major priority right now is because you can chop um, mortises with a bench chisel and you may find that boring out the mortise using a brace and bed or cordless drill or whatever and then just paring your mortise to shape may end up being the preferred method of doing it. It can certainly be a lot faster in some instances. When I'm doing through mortises, I do like to bore through and then pair out. Um, so in that, in that case, I'm using the bench chisel because it's just light pairing work. If I am chopping out a mortise entirely with a chisel, I do find the mortise chisel works a heck of a lot faster. I've got a lot more strength and durability. It's just a bigger, beefier tool that just cuts a heck of a lot faster than a bench chisel. But Man, there's so many other things that you may want to get before you go to, um, to a mortising chisel. John B., I'm sorry I missed your question. I don't know where it is. Um... Richard says, on the West Coast, there are no places to find wooden planes. Any suggestions for the unit? Are you sure about that, Richard? I've got quite a few hand tool school apprentices on the West Coast who seem to find more vintage planes than I do. Um, you might want to look a little bit more. I guess it depends on where on the West Coast. You know, I, the guys I'm referring to are in the Northwest, but I also know some folks in Northern California that have had luck, a couple guys in San Diego that have had luck. Um, I don't think I can speak of anybody in LA specifically, but um, you might want to look. But um, my general recommendation when it comes to buying um, vintage planes is always hyperkitten.com. Josh Clark is, the, the quality of the tools that he comes up with is just fantastic. He's a good businessman. He's always got good stuff and he's got lots more stuff than what's listed on his tools for sale list. So he's worth emailing to see uh, if he has what you're looking for. You eBay is hit or miss, and nine times out of ten, I find eBay is more expensive with a lower quality tool, so I tend to not spend a lot of time there anymore. Um, JimBodeTools.com, B-O-D-E, um, is another good resource. Jim stuff is a lot more expensive, but it also tends to have a little bit more collectible value to it. Um, but Jim also has non-collectible stuff that uh, he can find all kinds of things for you. He's the guy that actually found my Barnes number three lathe for me. So those are the two resources I look at. Um, Superior Tools, another good one. Um, but uh, I'd say nine out of 10 times if I'm buying uh, a vintage tool, wooden plane, metal plane, chisel, pairing chisel, whatever, I'm having good luck through Josh Clark at Hyperkitten. So that's what I'm gonna go with. Andrew asks if I've used a float. I was thinking of getting a Lee Nielsen float for through mortises. I bought a float for the exact same reason. When they first came out on the scene, everybody was talking about how wonderful they are. I'm not a fan. Um, 
I understand why they're good, but, um, and maybe I just haven't used them enough to really get a feel for it. Um, I would much rather just grab a chisel. If I am paring the walls of a mortise, a chisel is just going to do a much better job than using um, a float. And while I understand that a float is not quite a rasp, it's close enough to a rasp, but I question why would I would do that when I can just use a, um, a chisel. Where floats really came into their own was with plane makers, like bed floats and things like that. Um, the whole cheek float idea of a tenon, I just don't, I don't get that. I'd rather use a rabbiting block plane or more importantly, a nice wide chisel. So I put a lot of emphasis on chisel work. I find that being good, working with the chisel, being able to handle the chisel, just kind of makes you super powered woodworker because they're such flexible tools. So it's possible that I overlook a lot of techniques just because I don't feel that they're necessary. Um, I think your skills would thank you for getting more comfortable with the chisel than relying specifically on a float. Um, but again, it could just be that I'm not using them enough to have unlocked the true majesty of the float. So ask a plane maker, you know, see what they say um, and why they would rely upon a float over a chisel to cut a bed angle of a, a bedding angle of a plane. Probably because you've got just a little bit more control in areas that you can't quite see. That would be what I would guess. So uh, Josiah wants to know what angle I sharpen my rabbit plane. I sharpen all of my planes. All of my planes, every single one of my planes, <laughs> 25 degrees. I've never found a need to, to change that angle. That's not true. I have a bevel up smoothing plane that has a higher angle um, blade on it. Uh, that's at, uh, what is it? It's a Veritas one, 30, 32 degrees, I think. Um, and I also have a 50 degree blade, but I've only used that like twice. <laughs> that's that's like the, 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 the fusion option. Well. Yeah, that's definitely the nuclear option there. Not fission, fusion option. Um, all of them are at 25 degrees. There, there's just been no need to change that angle at all um, for anything. And especially because for the most part, all of my planes are beveled down. And the angle of the plane, the angle of the bevel is not affecting the cutting action. It's the angle of the bed or the frog angle that's affecting the cutting action. So while you might say that you can get a more durable edge by going with a higher bevel angle, I question what are you doing with your plane that you need that durable of an edge? Um, the only super aggressive planing I'm doing is with a four plane, you know, where I'm taking sometimes a 16th to an eighth of an inch thick shaving, but the scooping action of the curved blade is what's making that possible. It's actually putting less stress on the blade because of that scoop. So um, if you're worried about damaging the edge of your plane because 25 degrees may be too low, I think you're probably working with, with a dull plane blade to begin with. So for the most part, I found 25 degrees and I say every plane because it's just so much easier to just sharpen all the same angle. Although full disclosure, since I do everything freehand, I don't care what the angle is. <laughs> the angle is whatever it registers on the stone or the strop, that's the angle. Um, and I would say the same thing, um, almost the same thing with all of my chisels as well. Um, my mortise chisels are sharpened higher. My Lee Nielsen chisels are sharpened higher because that's how they were ground from the factory and I was too lazy to grind them any differently. Um, my pairing chisels, however, are generally around 20, 20 degrees. They're lower um, because they slice a little bit better than, than that, than, than a 25 degree, so. Phew, lots of questions on here. Okay, Richard's in Central California. Well, and you know, uh, a lot of people, I'm hearing a lot of people say that the, you know, the antique stores are, uh, what did Gazank say, picked over? That's a good way to put it. Um, and that can be true. I feel that way out here. Um, I can honestly say that I've sought out a bunch more antique stores lately because I'm pretty good with tools. Um, but uh, I mean, you gotta know what you're looking for. A lot of times, if you're just out there browsing kind of blindly, hey, any tool that comes along, you're gonna have a little bit more success um, in finding tools. But I find more than anything that I walk away from more tools than I buy because I become very picky on what I'm looking for. Because um, frankly, I don't really like restoring tools. So if I've got to do major surgery to a tool, I end up walking away from it. Um, 
but uh, uh, you know, I usually have good success seeking out those like antique towns, you know, where there's 20 different antique stores in the town. Maybe you just don't have those in Central California region. Um, I don't know, but it, you know, in which case, Josh Clark again, really, really good resource. Gary wants to know if you can over tighten your clamps when gluing up a panel. Yeah, I think so. Um, for a couple of reasons. If you are using a regular F style clamp, if you apply too much pressure, certainly you can in, introduce a bow to the, the board that's in there, um, to the panel that's in the clamp. Because you've got the pressure on the clamp and then kind of the fulcrum set a distance away from it, you can introduce a fair amount of bow there because you've got quite a bit of um, mechanical advantage. In a parallel clamp, you've got a lot more rigidity in the I-beam structure and you can more evenly apply, I can set it right on the beam and the clamping pressure is a lot closer, but you can still introduce some, some bow because these things have like the highest clamping pressure out there. So um, I think it's relatively easy to apply too much. Can you over clamp it to the point where you squeeze, squeeze the joint dry? I've never experienced that. I've heard people talk about that, but I've never really experienced that. So I don't think that's too much of an issue. I think what you have to worry about is introducing that bow more than anything else. And another thing when clamping a panel, um, one of the reactions to avoid the bow is have one board slip higher than the other. If I've got too much pressure and it has nowhere to go, it may just want to relieve that pressure by slipping upward. And if you end up with panels that have that like step on it, generally that may be too much clamping pressure. So what I always do when I'm clamping, especially with my parallel clamps, I'll, I'll slide it up, you know, manually through the ratcheting me mechanism, slide it up manually, and then I'll clamp it until I start to see squeeze out. Once I get even squeeze out along the joint, I'll take one more pass all the way around the panel with all the clamps, just turn it about, you know, that much, whatever that is, about a quarter turn, just enough. And I, I feel good there. Um, if you're getting even squeeze out, that's generally enough pressure. Um, and I think with those parallel clamps, you've got so much mechanical advantage, you could very easily apply far too much pressure. And then you're just introducing way too much tension into the board and that could cause issues over time. <sighs> Wooden combination planes. Do I know anything about this plane? Not really. Um, I mean, Chapin is a, is a very good, uh, prestigious brand, I guess. I mean, they, they made a lot of planes, but um, that's, a, that's a question that you wanna talk to. Actually, again, Josh Clark, he's kind of a walking encyclopedia of vintage tools. He knows a lot about the individual manufacturers. Um, but no, was, I get this question all the time. What can you tell me about this plane? And I'm just not, I'm a historian of techniques, but not so much as uh, uh, an historian of, of the tool makers themselves. There's just nothing that I've spent much time researching. So I don't know that I can really help you there. Uh, Gary says that the concern was squeezing the joint dry. I, I just don't think so, Gary. I, I mean, I, I guess it's possible. And yes, you're definitely over clamping it if you're actually squeezing it, it dry. But um, yeah, that would take a hell of a lot of pressure. Um, and I think more than anything, what's happening is the, um, the lubrication provided by the glue is causing the joints to slip back and forth. And as you maybe are adjusting it, say that panel slips up and then you come back and, and kind of clamp it down while well, you're scraping glue off. So I suppose that that's possible there. So if, if you have had to adjust that panel a number of times back into level, then you might be in danger of possibly scraping away too much glue. But even then, it does not take very much glue. I mean, uh, um, PVA, Type Bond, Type Bond 2, 3, they're not gap filling. So they were relying upon a thin layer of glue to do the work. And the thicker amount of glue is actually going to cause a problem because Type Bond PVA glue in general does not bond to itself. It doesn't bond glue to glue. So if you've got too much glue in there, that's a problem. The thinner that layer, um, usually the better off. So I would be really, 
um, surprised if you could actually clamp it too much dry. I think it's more not so much squeezing dry, but scraping it dry. Uh, Andrew, I have a glue pot. I have the, the fancy one from Tools for Working Wood. I know a lot of people have used paraffin wax, um, uh, wax warmers to, sorry, the question is, how do you keep your hide glue warm? Um, I have a glue pot. It's right here behind the camera. It's filled with water and it's plugged in right now. So, cause I've got glue heating, just this little thing. It comes in its own double boiler. Warmer dealy, uh, keeps them at constant temperature. Come on, go back in there. Yeah, using calls to keep them parallel is a good way. I still did a video on this a while back. Um, I use these guys, my panel clamps that I made. Um, I've got a couple homemade ones, and then I've got a couple that I use the fancy Veritas panel clamping system. It's like the Wonder Dog with a post in it. Um, these are incredibly effective. The issue, of course, with calls, and this is more of an issue for the hand tool shop, is that the boards have to be the same thickness because the call is coming in and it's squeezing down on both sides. If you're gluing up something that's a little bit rougher that maybe the boards are not the same thickness, then the call doesn't work well for you. But I only do that when I'm like really cutting, cutting corners sounds bad. When I'm throwing shortcuts into the mix, a lot of times I'll glue up a panel and I haven't actually planed the surface. Or if I have, I've just gone over it with my four plane or scrub plane just to kind of look at the grain. Then I'm gluing up the panel and then I'm surfacing the whole panel as one. I found that sometimes it's a little bit more efficient to do it that way rather than going for a finished panel right off the glue joint. Um, but that's a purely hand tool approach. If you're using planer and things to surface a lot of your boards ahead of time, you know, yeah, uh, the there's no excuse really at that point. A call or a panel clamp is a good way to keep it, keep everything straight. Mike, uh, Mike, you asked the question originally about dovetail saws. Do you think I should get one of those magnetic guides? Um, personally, Mike, I don't think so. Uh, and I have to be careful how I phrase this. Because people always get very itchy touchy about this, but I, I think that Anytime you're using a guide like that, in some ways you're kind of selling yourself short. Um, it can be a great way to do training wheels, but I don't see those magnetic guides so much as training wheels um, because they're not really teaching you to cut without them, right? You know, training wheels is to get, get you up on the bike and get things rolling with the idea of eventually taking them off. And if you use that magnetic guide, once you take it off, I don't find it necessarily translates. This is not speaking from personal appearance because I've, I've used those guides and I've only used them a very short amount of time and I already knew how to cut dovetails once I used them. So it's not, it doesn't, um, it's not a fair comparison. So I've heard lots of people who have used those magnetic guides and have been quite happy with them, but I haven't, um, I haven't heard from anybody who used the guide and then ditched it and now doesn't do it anymore. Um, I'm sure they're out there. I just haven't personally heard from them. To me, I think, and I said this earlier, sawing, I think, is, is more important. Instead of buying another plane, buy another saw. Sawing is probably the most important hand tool school you, uh, skill you can have. You hear that Freudian slip, hand tool school? Yeah, the most important skill you can have is a membership in the hand tool school. God, I even make my own skin crawl with that sales pitch. I think that developing good sawing and precision sawing is easily one of the most important things you can do because hand tool woodworking is nothing more than cutting to a line. And a saw will cut to a line really, really fast. Compound angles, simple angles. There's no such thing as a non, because even 90 degrees is an angle, right? That having that skill is something that by using a magnetic guide, I feel like you're, you're selling yourself short there. And I think that taking a board, clamping it upright in a vise, grabbing a dozuki, grabbing a dovetail saw, whatever, and sawing 10 lines, just 10 lines, will make a dramatic difference in how well you saw. Sawing 100 lines will make it even more. That's a bit overkill. Just sitting down and cutting a couple dovetail joints, you will be shocked at how much better your first dovetail joint to like your fifth dovetail joint would be. And I'm actually not even a big proponent of the whole dovetail a day practice type thing. I like to just jump in. Um, build a chest of drawers. You wanna get good at dovetails? Build a chest of drawers. 
And when you build, say there's five drawers in the chest, start on the back corner of the bottom drawer, work across that back corner of the bottom drawer. And if you don't feel real good there, start in the back corner of the next to bottom drawer. And if you don't feel good there, start in the back corner of the third drawer. Um, and by the time you get up to the top, doing the back corners that no one's ever gonna see, you're gonna feel pretty dang good about cutting dovetail joints. So then you move to the front corner of the bottom drawer. When you think about a chest of drawers, it's, the bottom drawer is way down there. The only people who are ever gonna really get a close look at those dovetails is your dog or cat, or the woodworkers 100 years from now who are crawling around underneath your furniture to see how you made it. You're never gonna get a real close look at those dovetails. So if they're a little bit gappy and they're gonna be in shadow, you're gonna be okay. By the time you get to the front corner of that top drawer, you'll be shocked at how good your dovetails are. And you didn't need a guide and you built a skill that can be transferred onto something else. So yeah, um, so no, I, I mean, while I don't debate the merit of those magnetic guides, I feel like for long-term skill building, um, it's just not, it's just not something that I would, I would, um, I would buy into really. How about boring braces, bits, types of jaws and ratchets? Uh, the brace is a relatively simple tool. There's not a lot to it. Um, I have two jaw and three jaw mechanisms. I see very little difference from one to the other. Three jaws, certainly it's going to grip a little bit better. It'll line the bit a little bit better, but a two jaw mechanism works just as well. Because you're talking about a pyramidal shank, it's going to hold it really well. And once it's clamped down, it holds really fine. I have never once been in a situation where I've needed the ratchet on my brace. My, um, two of my vintage braces are new enough that I have a ratcheting mechanism. Never once used it. So it's not really a, a factor for me. So. Um, I think more than anything, just buying a brace that functions, which is kind of hard to find a brace that doesn't function. There's not a whole lot of moving parts to it. Um, has a six inch swing to it. I guess technically it's a 12 inch swing or a 10 inch swing would even work well. And you're good to go, frankly. There's just not a lot to them. Um, I wouldn't overthink it more than anything. <laughs> Great question, Christopher. Why do woodworking books and history books stop at the 16th century. It's like woodworking did not exist before that. Um, so in other words, why do they only go back as far as the, I was gonna say, they don't stop. They talk a lot about the 18th century. In other words, why do they not go prior to uh, the 18th or the 17th century? Um, that's not entirely true. There are some, there are um, first century woodworking is the first book that comes to mind. Um, that's definitely about prior to uh, 17th century, 16th century. Um, there are some medieval woodworking books, but, and there's even, there's an even, uh, an Egyptian woodworking is another book, uh, George, I can't remember the name of the author. Amazon will find it faster than me. Egyptian woodworking is the name of it. Um, they talk about these, but what you'll find is that the techniques did not change much. So from a technique perspective, it was pretty much all mortise and tenon joinery, the occasional dovetail, but mostly mortise and tenon joinery up until really the 18th century, the William and Mary period to be specific. Everything prior to that, when you're talking about like Jacobean furniture, pilgrim furniture, however you want to call it, it's pretty much all mortise and tenon. Think about the stuff that Peter Follensby is, is known for making, the boarded chests and things. It was all mortise and tenon because we had dirt floors in our homes at the time. So we had to get the furniture up off of it. And the best way to do that was, you know, four legs that were posts and rails and styles, or rather just rails, that, that hooked into those legs and it kept the case up off the dirt floor. William and Mary started to use the dovetail which allowed for a central box that could then be put on legs. Um, so when you look at William and Mary furniture, it is a dovetailed box with legs that are inserted into the bottom. Well, that made for kind of chunky legs that needed a heavier tenon mechanism to keep those legs from being fragile at the case to um, leg junction. So they ended up being kind of bulky. So we moved into the Queen Anne period, it became very, very delicate and then brought back the cabrio leg with the central post and mortise and tendon and all that fun stuff. But prior to that revolution, if you will, into what people call the golden age of furniture in the 18th century, it was pretty much all mortise and tenon work. Moreover, here's the real fun part. 
Think about the socioeconomic structure prior to this. Other than royalty, right? Other than kings and queens, nobody had excess money. There was no middle class. It was either you were royalty or you were a freaking peasant. <laughs> or you were like a knight and you lived in the castle with the royalty. Um, the furniture wasn't built to last. The, there was no one buying super expensive furniture. When you look at the furniture of these museums now, it's the stuff that was built for the aristocracy. And the only reason it's still in one place is because it stayed in, you know, the nice castle and was never really, nobody really, you know, messed with it. And then it stayed in a museum after that. All of that peasant furniture, all that furniture that like Christopher Schwarz is trying to talk about with the anarchist design book, that stuff didn't last because it was, it was, you know, chopped up for firewood when the harvest didn't come in and we had to live through the winter and not die. Um, or it was built specifically and it was, you know, it wasn't necessarily, you know, I'm not going to say it wasn't built to last because a lot of that stuff certainly will hold up better than like your average, you know, big box store. But it just, it, it didn't carry on from one century to the next, from one family to the next. It was set on a dirt floor somewhere and it rotted away. When you go back into the medieval times, you know, there, there, there was no furniture that lasted over a long period. Plus, talk about the dark ages and upheaval and burning the village and pillaging and all that fun stuff. Things were just destroyed. Um, there was a lot of destruction, of wholesale destruction, and it just not a whole lot lasted. Egyptians the same way. They did a lot of woodworking, but it was pretty much all wiped out or ransacked and looted. So um, as far as an, from an historical perspective, one could make the, the argument that there wasn't enough evidence, widespread evidence, you know, to say here was a general style. We can look at the paintings, we can look at, you know, cave, cave paintings, pyramid paintings and tomb paintings and things like that to get some idea of the stuff they were doing. But you're also talking about tropical climates um, and the wood just, the furniture just rotted away. It fell apart. Um, so yeah, I think, I think it's just not enough data points to have a significant amount of stuff to write about. Whereas when you look at the 18th century, there is examples everywhere. So scholars can write till they're blue in the face and put out this book and this book and this book, and I'm gonna make a new conclusion here because I've got 300 data points to support my conclusion. Whereas if you go further back, there's just not enough data points to say, here's what it is. And if, and if that's wrong, then um, there's an opportunity for you <laughs> to, to make a book on that. So yeah, I, don't, I just, I don't think there's enough data out there. Uh, what radius do I use in my four plane, Dwayne? Um, I use uh, an eight inch, yeah, eight inch radius on my four plane. Three inch radius on my scrub plane. I have used up to a 10 inch radius. I prefer an eight inch. After time, what is your evaluation of LED lighting? I love it. Love it. So much brighter. For me though, it's because I've got so much more control, individual dimmability of the lights, because again, this is wood shop, but also film studio more than anything else. If you were to build a five foot workbench, what would the minimum thickness of the top be? Um, I say thickness of the top is based upon the material you can buy. Uh, minimum thickness, I mean, it depends upon the design, right? If you're building one that's got an apron, if you're building like a Nicholson style with a wide apron, you can go a one and a half inch thick, typical construction lumber, and it's perfectly fine. You've got plenty of, of support under there. If you're building a, like a French style that doesn't have an apron support, you need a thicker top. Um, you look at the stiffness ratings of most of the lumber out there, and you know, you're gonna get some flex on a one and a half inch thick top. So if you're building big box lumber, construction lumber, Double stack and we got a three inch top and you should be plenty of fine, you should be fine, uh, especially on a five foot workbench. But even five feet, well, I mean five feet, at most you're gonna have what? Two, maybe two and a half feet of span. So you probably would be okay. The biggest issue is um, hold fast. Hold fast will hold and a one and a half inch thick top, but they're gonna hold so much better in a thicker top. So to me, if you're gonna go to the trouble of making your own workbench, I would go at least three inches thick, just not even so much for hold fast ability or thickness, but sheer mass. If you're gonna do any hand planing on that bench, you want it to be massive so it won't walk around on the floor, in which case, double layer of the construction grade stuff to get at least three inches. Me personally, I like a four inch thick top. I just, it's manly. Yeah, Richard, you read my mind. Lost Art Press has many books on the subject of furniture of the past. Definitely check out 
the Anarchist Design Book, uh, Estonian Woodworking is another good one. Yeah, there's, there's stuff there. All right, I need to call it quits here. Did I miss something? Good question, William. Do you notice enough of a difference between cow and horse butt? Why do my, top, my conversations always end up talking about horses' butts? Um, do I notice enough of a difference between cow leather and horse butt leather to make the switch? Um, if you already have one, in other words, no, I wouldn't worry about it. Um, I bought my horse butt strop because uh, Joel Moskowitz raved about it at Tools for Working Wood, and I knew I was going to start getting questions about it. And I thought, you know what? What is it, like 19 bucks, 20 some bucks? I figured it was worth a shot. Um, I like the fact that it's loose. I like to be able to use both sides of the strop, but I have another um, cow leather um, strop that's free and it works just fine too. So no, I don't think it's necessarily worth making a specific switch from one over the other. So my joiner bench is um, made up of four by sixes. So it's three and a half inches thick. The apron uh, is wider than that, but the apron is what captures it on tops of the leg. So this section here is three and a half inches thick. Hey, thank you, Andrew. That's very nice of you. Okay, I'll take this last question because I got duped on this. What is your opinion on SketchUp going web only? Um, the online version of SketchUp, I hate. <laughs> and I think that's mainly because I'm used to the other one. I can't use any of the keyboard shortcuts and a lot of the tools that I normally use are not there. But it's not true that it's web only. You can still download um, the desktop version. and I don't know how much longer that will be supported. What it, I can't remember what version that is. It's whatever version I'm running on my system now. Um, you may have to go to the site and specifically search for um, the older version, but you can download it because I did that. Um, I updated my SketchUp and it moved me to the, the paid version and I had to use the web version for a while. And then I just went on to SketchUp and used the search bar and searched for the older version and it was still there and I downloaded it. So. Uh, as far as I know, it's, um, it's still being supported. So until I guess if they stop supporting it, then maybe I'll have issues. But um, I'm not a good enough SketchUp user that I, that I can justify buying the pro version because I just don't use a lot of the stuff that they, they need there. So yeah, not, not a fan of the web-only version. So anyway, hello, Dr. Crazy. You are crazy 1 a.m. to be up for this. So... Um, if I missed your question, sorry guys, um, I will be back. I'm not sure when I would normally do this. If I did this halfway through April, I would come back, uh, um, two weeks, but I'll actually be on my way to find woodworking live up in Connecticut, um, two weeks from now on Thursday. So if you're going to be at find woodworking live, look me up. I'm happy to shake your hand and say hello. Uh, if not, I'll try to figure something out, um, the week after that, the week after the 20th or something like that. So if nothing else, I'm always here the first Thursday of every month. Cool guys. Everyone have a wonderful evening and I always appreciate you coming out. Great questions.